Pleasant Thursday evening out to all of our viewers out there. You're tuned into primetime news on TV1. Many important incidents taking place in the country today uh, with the possibility of a train strike looming over our heads scheduled to begin at midnight and the passage of the extension of emergency regulations in the country. Both affect the lives of the general public in our country. We've got details of these stories and more coming up on our news tonight. But first, a look at your top stories. Finance Minister says demands of railway employees cannot be met. 24-hour strike from midnight tonight. Opposition raises objection over ministers being absent during debate on emergency regulations. New laws for cabinet to take over certain powers of the Public Utilities Commission. Proposal to appoint new members to the commission. SLTB receives luxury buses from China. Starting off with your top story tonight, the extension of the emergency regulations by one month was passed without a vote in Parliament today. The opposition, however, raised concerns over the notable absence of certain responsible ministers of government during the debate. The usual tradition is that as the President is the Minister of Defence, the State Minister would present this proposal. If not, the proposal for the debate is presented by the Leader of the House or at least an organiser of the government. The usual tradition is that at least a responsible Cabinet Minister would present this proposal. This is in contravention of that. The Defence Minister or the Deputy Minister of Defence does not respond to any of our queries. Leader of the House, do you approve of this situation? Then who are we debating with? Not clarifying any of these matters to Parliament just shows how responsible the government is on matters of national security. The relevant minister should be present here. While MP Andra Kumara Disanayaka was speaking in Parliament, State Minister of Defence Ruan Vijayawardana entered the chambers. What time did you wake up? This is your debate. Remember that this is the debate on national security of the people of the country. You are bound to at least provide answers to these questions. At least present a report to Parliament on the current security situation in the country. I saw you going to Minuangoda with an entourage of motorbikes. Why are you acting like this? And then in town hall, I am not sure if that allegation was leveled against you. Security is only a show for you. MP, I am not sure about that. I have not been told who the person is. What happened in Minuangoda was not something I wanted. When I visited Minuangoda, everyone gathered in one place to welcome me. I didn't request for something like that. I am not someone who prefers exhibitions like that. Questions were again raised about the absence of the representatives of the government in the evening. Please have a look. There's nobody for the government. There's absolutely no one. We are talking about national security here. Millions are spent on a daily basis to convene parliament. The following views were expressed during the parliamentary debate today. Following the incident, 2,389 people have been arrested. 236 suspects are currently in remand custody. 189 individuals are under detention orders while three of them were arrested under the emergency law and 186 were arrested under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. We have created a suitable environment where legal action can be initiated against the 263 individuals of the 425. At present, even the government is in crisis. We listened to the speech made by the Prime Minister a week ago. The Prime Minister and President are conflicting in terms of decisions and opinions and cannot work together. The President himself said that he cannot work with the Prime Minister. 
This is the present situation in the country. The constitutional crisis between the president and the prime minister has now resulted in an economic crisis. We believe that it is non-democratic to allow the governors of eight provinces to use the second largest budget allocation without holding provincial council elections. One half of the Provincial Councils Act has been approved while the remaining half is pending approval. The previous method is now abolished. The UNP was always on the stance that we should not proceed with the previous method. It was they who demanded the new method. However, when the method was presented to Parliament, only one half was approved. You disagreed to the divisional method. So far, they have arrested every suspected link to terrorism. We all accept that the country has returned to normalcy. We have requested foreign nationals to visit Sri Lanka. However, foreign countries say that Sri Lanka is still not safe due to the tense situations. In that sense, who is creating such tense situations? There is a group who promotes hate speech and racism. However, the emergency law is not enforced against such individuals. Now that's the issue. In another one of your headline-making stories, tonight Railway Trade Union announced another 24-hour strike starting from midnight today. According to the unions, they will stage a 24-hour strike from 12 midnight on Thursday every week until their demands are met. Railway trade unions launched a strike action over the failure to implement the cabinet paper that was approved to remove the salary anomalies of railway employees. The unions launched a one-day token strike at midnight on the 20th of this month over the same demands. The lost cost of the country as a result of the strike action was 19 million rupees. Trade unions representing the railway drivers, regulators, operators, station masters and railway oversight managers joined the strike. This trade union action will be stayed from midnight today till midnight tomorrow. We express our regret if the general public is inconvenienced due to the strike action. From 2015, we were given false promises and a cabinet paper that was approved has still not been implemented. If the government is unable to solve this issue, we will continue our trade union action. Against this backdrop, a Gazette notification was issued this evening, making railway services an essential service. It was signed by President's Council Udayar Seniviratna. The Gazette was issued considering the fact that any service provided by a state corporation, department, provincial council, cooperative union or outlet is essential for the daily lives of the general public. Thereby all services at the railways department, including railway travel, railway and road maintenance and issuing of tickets have been named as essential services. Currently, emergency regulations are in force island-wide. A gazette was issued under emergency regulations, naming this an essential service. Therefore, there is a law that applies if those engaged in essential services stage a strike. We have to work according to that law. All drivers working on contract basis have been called in. There are about 60 there. So we will be able to continue to provide railway services even if they continue the strike action. A cabinet paper has already been approved on solving the issues of the railway employees and the Ministry of Finance must take a decision on removing the salary anomalies of these employees. If we agree to everything they say, there will be an even bigger problem of salary anomalies of workers in other fields. If there are no trains, we will deploy more buses. Sadarne, <laughs> Nine luxury buses were handed over to the Sri Lanka Transport Board today. A total sum of 153.9 million rupees was spent to acquire these luxury buses. These buses are to be added to the fleet of buses in seven bus depots island-wide. <laughs> These buses are equipped with passenger safety features, air conditioning and security camera systems. We are still used to building our buses on lorry chassis and transporting the people of this country. 
These buses were handed over to the SATB as a measure of changing this situation. It is planned to bring down 2,000 of these buses to Sri Lanka. <laughs> Four completed school development projects under the Pibidemu Polo Narua District Development Program was vested with the public today. The completed two-storied building at the Bendiwa Mahavidyalaya, with all facilities inclusive, was handed over to the students by President Maitri Palasri Sena. 17.6 million rupees has been spent on this project. <laughs> Another building with six classrooms at the Ilukweva Kanishta Vidyalaya was vested with the students by the president. 10.6 million rupees had been spent on this building. Then me gami inna tamunnaan silagi idangvala oppu balapatra lavila diya noad. Idangvala ta balapatra diya noad oppu diya noad. Lavila ne ko pradeshi le kam tumiya. Aye. Huh? when I last visited Alutweva, I informed the divisional secretary to visit Irukweva, Morgasweva, Alutweva once a month and resolve these issues. If the divisional secretary's job is done properly, we will not have these issues in villages. I was not informed about the licenses. These should have been discussed at the meeting in the Kutch area. I would have resolved these issues. These issues are not brought up at meetings and this is not a good thing. Now two people were killed when a mound of earth collapsed in Potupitiya Kalavana today. Our correspondent said that two other individuals had sustained injuries. The 15 feet high mound of earth collapsed on the victims who were engaged in excavation activities to construct the foundation for a school building. According to our correspondent, the accident took place at around 9 this morning. When attempts were being made to rescue the victims, another mound of earth had collapsed. Two individuals who sustained injuries were in the second mound collapse. Uh, were admitted to the Potopitiya and Kalavana base hospitals. The deceased... I have a dream to gift her an Olympic medal. This is your chance to dream with me. The news now. Back to some news from Parliament. The following views were expressed regarding the People's Bank in Parliament today. This rumour is fake and nothing but a lie. I even released a statement in this regard yesterday. I'm not sure whether our friends from the JVP are falling for the lies of MP Malvira answer. This is a lie. We have no plans to privatize the People's Bank or the Bank of Ceylon. The People's Bank is a 100% state-owned enterprise. It made profits of 17 billion rupees last year. The Treasury takes all of these profits, depriving the bank from further development. However, they now claim that there are no funds to develop the bank and that the bank is facing capital inadequacy. So what does the government propose? They are attempting to amend the Banks Act and permit the sale of 10% of the bank's shares to external parties. However, they are trying to fool the people by saying that the 10% will be given to depositors and employees of the bank. Only those who are not born in Sri Lanka will not have a bank account in People's Bank. So essentially, what they are trying to do is privatize this entity. <laughs> Employees and members of trade unions of state banks are worried as they have no confidence in the Minister of Finance. It was clearly stated through the budget proposals that there will be a share issuance. 
Mangal Samaravida issuing the release says that the state banks will not be privatized. However, he adds that debentures will be issued. If these debentures translate into shares, once these shares are sold, it will definitely be privatized. This is what the government is trying to do. I believe that after all of this, the UNP will obtain the least number of votes in the party's history. The UNP will lose. Still in more news from Parliament, it was revealed in Parliament today that the names of five new members to the Public Utilities Commission had been proposed to the Constitutional Council. Now, this was revealed while MP Andhra Kumara Desanayaka expressed his concerns over the attempts made by certain ministers to obtain the powers of independent commissions. The Public Utilities Commission was empowered to approve the prices of electricity. In addition, prior approval was required to purchase power. However, the Cabinet is now requesting to obtain the powers of the PUCSL to approve pricing of power. In the past, there have been several instances where the Cabinet has focused on bribes, commissions and other benefits instead of the difficulties faced by the general public. Was the Cabinet paper submitted to the Cabinet of Ministers to amend the Sri Lanka Electricity Act presented in Parliament? It was presented after obtaining the ideas and opinions of all 64 unions. It was presented for the benefit of the general public and not with any other motive. At present, there are tenders of more than four years. However, they have not proceeded in this regard. The PUCSL is of one opinion, then some request for coal power. At present, there is a power shortage in our country. If we continue like this, it will take another one and a half years. These are good to create issues. No, the 19th Amendment should be further strengthened and we remain in that stance. Five names have been presented to the Honourable Speaker and a new commission will be appointed. I'm not saying that the PUCSL is wrong in any aspect. The PUCSL has many positive features that are commendable. There is a cold war between the PUCSL and the Electricity Board. Due to this cold war, I am afraid I will have to say this in public. Our engineers have not participated in certain tender committees for four years. The Cabinet has decided to empower the PUCSL in areas such as protecting consumer rights and regulation of security. The power sector will be regularized according to government policies and under the purview of the Cabinet. The amendments required for these provisions have been approved and been submitted to the Legal Draftsman's Department. The past record of certain Cabinet Ministers is not that good. What sort of an impression will the general public get when they learn that Minister Ravi Karunanayaka is trying to take over the powers of the PUCSL? The people will think that it is one of his political <coughs> games as he does not have a very good past record. The JVP convened a media briefing at the party headquarters earlier today. We have presented a no-confidence motion in Parliament. This is scheduled to be debated in Parliament on the 10th and the 11th. What needs to be done is to move closer to the people and give the opportunity to the general public to decide by going for an election. This is to establish a new government in power. This election is not held to see if the Rajapaksas will run away or come back. On the contrary, the JVP takes the responsibility of guiding the general public to achieve a political movement. In line with the no-confidence motion debate scheduled to be on the 10th and the 11th, we have organized a rally on the 7th and the 8th. This two-day rally is organized from Kalutara to Nugegude. This government has no right to govern this country for even five months. Therefore, we are trying to chase them before the five months are up. Parliamentarian Kumar Velgama made the following remarks when questioned by journalists regarding the presidential candidate for the upcoming elections. I will extend my support to a good candidate who has not committed any crime, murder or given orders to murder someone. Every government has committed crime and murder to hold on to power. If there is no such candidate in either of these governments, I will not support anyone. Has someone debarred me from speaking the truth? I have a spine to speak out in public if a certain candidate has a mistake. This is not to cross over to the UNP. I will not cross over to the UNP. I joined the SLFP and I will die an SLFP. -er. I have a backbone to speak out without fear. No one should misunderstand that. 
ඇවිල්ලා මේ වරද වාව වටහා ගන්න අවශ්‍ය නැහැ ඒකට. ඒ වගේම දැන් ඔබතුමාට මේ සම්බන්ධව අනිත් පාර්සල් චෝදනා එල්ල වෙන්නේ නැද්ද මේ ඔබතුමා විරුද්ධව කතා කරනවා කියලා. මේ මරේ ඉතින් එහෙම චෝ there are no such allegations. When I speak the truth, how can anyone raise allegations? That would only happen if I was lying. So there should not be any allegations. The nail leg ran on me. Tama to be the master of the entire squad. Mama, we are not going to be. Then in no way, Mantri, Mantri, or Sir, did not. So, so I am thinking that the entire squad thing. What the man is going to do tomorrow? We are not affected by the fact that the entire squad is not going to be there. No, no. Mangi, he may not be with that one. No, I will not extend my support. I will not take decisions of that nature. And as I said, I will extend my support to a person who I feel like doing so. It will be for a person who I can support according to my conscience. I cannot say it just yet because it has not happened. Tawama mata kiyanne ba mokada tawama nam kala ne. Treasurer of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party SB Desanayaka convened a media briefing in Kandy today. When President Maithripala Sirisena visited India, he met the Prime Minister of India and said, quote, "We have developed the East Container Terminal. We will give you the West Container Terminal to develop." End quote. Willingly the Indian prime minister then said that he has already given it to a capable Indian naval organization to develop it it was mentioned at the cabinet and we were there then the prime minister panicked and so did Malik and Mangala then the prime minister said that they have made a decision to hand over the east terminal when they said it was approved the cabinet and the president panicked the president said to hand over the west terminal and not the east but we heard that agreements have been signed and steps have been taken to give away the east container terminal why because that easily comes to 7 or 8 billion rupees at a time when everything is ready to elect a patriotic president through a wide alliance don't fall for these conspiracies because in 3 months at the presidential election we can appoint a new patriotic president we can even establish a government the very next day ape shakti mat desa premi janadipati wareya pat karagana e pahu da mandu kapata hada ganna e e tena maithri pala sinsele dana kwarene කවුරු හරි බිම් මට්ටමේ තත්ත්වය අපිට වඩා හොඳින් තේරුම් ගන්න ජනාධිපති මෛත්‍රීපාල සිරිසේන මැතිතුමාට ශක්තිය තියෙනවා. අද මාර්ගයේ හිල් කර ඉස්සෝ දේවප්‍රිය මැතිතුමා කියලා තියෙනවා ශ්‍රී ලංකා නිදහස් පක්ෂය අපේක්ෂකයේ ජනාධිපති වෙන්න ඉදිරිපත් කරනවා. එතුමා වර්තමාන ජනාධිපති මෛත්‍රීපාල සිරිසේන මැතිතුමාට. ඒ නියම සක්‍රියතාවයක් තියෙනවා දුටුමන්දන්න. කෘත්‍ය අධිකාරී මණ්ඩලයේ යෝජනාවක් සම්මත කරගෙන තියෙනවා. ඒ කියන්නේ කිසි වරදක් නැහැ. It is not suitable to mention names. Mahindra Rajapaksa represents the main patriotic political force, but not even he says a name. That is because we want all the patriotics together. There are people like that in parties and alliances. We don't have to consider things like that. We can listen to what they say and just laugh. Here are some of the views that were expressed regarding the security agreements between Sri Lanka and the United States. Acquisition and cross service. The acquisition and cross servicing agreement was signed in 2007. It was signed by their so-called next presidential candidate, Gotabe Rajapaksa. Vimal Veerawansa, who has a small brain, was in the cabinet. He was with them in the government, but he did not speak a word about this. Now he says that we are betraying the country by renewing the agreement that was signed back then. What is the difference between these two documents? As per Vimal Veerawansa's small brain. the severity of this document is decided by the number of pages he has not even read what is in this document i would not make fun of a person for not being able to read english but this makes it evident that they can't read english there are annexes for all agreements he must be thinking that the people of this country are fools that is why he makes statements to the world that this agreement would betray the nation i have seen vimal veerawansa reprimanding the usa and consuming lollipops at disneyland Vasudevan Nanak Kara reprimands the USA from here but his children are educated there they are also living in the USA what is this then padinchi vela inne te amerikave iti me mokadda then itte ba avilla ke i do not know whether the porcupine and the ant eater had an agreement the porcupine allowed the ant eater to enter with or without an agreement but thereafter the porcupine flexed its quills and the ant eater had to leave If we are allowing the military and economic powers of a nation that is trying to establish their military presence around the world to come into our country, we must first understand that in a way we are surrendering our nation. We will be told that this is the way of economic development. We will give plots of land to America connecting the port and Colombo. There will be industries and businesses that will come up there. 
the lands will be utilized better than it is being done right now. This is the neoliberal economic vision and suggestions that are coming out as a result of it. When all of this happens, we will lose ownership of this country and we will be made outsiders. It is people like Mangala Samaravira who do not have a strong connection to this nation who can come forward and say we would receive 480 to 500 million dollars and show it as a silver lining. We have not received a cent. Charita Ratpate and the group went to USA to discuss the MCC with the money that they took from the treasury. They bought air tickets with that money and they spent it for the hotels there. The United States of America did not even spend their money to buy these people a cup of tea. This is the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report published on the 1st of June 2019. Here is the part that is about Sri Lanka. Since 2015, DOD has strengthened its relationship with Sri Lanka and increased military engagement significantly. We conducted the first port visit in 30 years by a U.S. aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, and the first ever bilateral cooperation afloat readiness and training exercise in 2019. We increased cooperation on mutual logistics arrangement in support of Indian Ocean security and disaster response. This is said <coughs> in a U.S. report. <laughs> Now, reports state that Abdullah Lufthi, the mastermind behind the 1988 terror plot that killed 19 Maldivians, had been at the Maldivian embassy in Colombo for nearly two months until May. Issuing a statement, the Maldives police confirmed that Lufthi surrendered himself to embassy officials on the 1st of May. However, the whereabouts of this Maldivian national continues to remain unclear. It is believed that Lufthi surrendered to the embassy officials amid sweeps by Sri Lankan security forces in the aftermath of the April 21st attacks. The news of Lufthi hiding inside the embassy gained public attention following a tweet by former Maldivian Home Minister Umar Nasir. Maldivian Commissioner of Police Mohammed Hamid said on Tuesday that attempts were underway to extradite Abdullah Lufthi within 48 hours. Quoting the police commissioner, Maldivian media reported that Maldivian police assumed responsibility over Lufthi at once and had been working closely with relevant authorities to return him to the Maldives. However, according to the Commissioner of Police, the extradition process was delayed due to various complications such as Lutfi owning documents seeking a certain amount of protection from the United Nations. Maldivian media reported that the Maldivian Ministry of Foreign Affairs released an official statement confirming that the delay was caused by the same reasons listed by the police. When inquired, the Sri Lankan Police Media Division said Sri Lanka police has not received information of the Maldivian national. Speaking to News First, an official of the Maldivian consulate in Sri Lanka said the consulate cannot comment on the matter. News First tried to contact the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to inquire if there are attempts made by the Maldivian Embassy in Sri Lanka to safeguard a terrorist using diplomatic immunity. The 1988 Maldives coup d'etat was the attempt by a group of Maldivians led by Abdullah Lufthi to overthrow the government of Maldives. However, they failed to capture former President Abdul Gayoom after the Indian government dispatched 1,600 troops by air to restore order in Malay. Lutfi, who is sentenced to life, fled to Sri Lanka after he was... ...have a dream to gift her an Olympic medal. This is your chance to dream with me. Welcome back to the news. In more news from here at home, Transparency International Sri Lanka convening a media briefing once again called on the 225 members of parliament to publicly disclose their declarations of assets and liabilities in the interest of strengthening their accountability and as an example of their commitment to an open democracy. The date is fast approaching. Is there any hope that all 225 will make publicize? That is an interesting question because non-disclosure of an asset declaration, non-submission constitutes an offence under the uh, asset declaration law. 
So just as we are looking at whether they will make it publicly available, it is important for us to also ask and obtain this information as to how many have truly submitted their asset declarations even to Parliament and to Cabinet. Meanwhile, a senior official of the Commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption speaking to News First said that the lack of a focal point to where the asset declarations are delivered has weakened the system. He stressed that the prevalent law that has been in use for more than 30 years requires serious amendments. He further clarified that if an individual decides not to declare his assets when he is required to do so, the Bribery Commission would have the power to conduct an investigation into the said individual. The Interim Parliamentary Committee set up to revise and establish parliamentary regulations in Maldives has made the decision to penalize the parliamentarians who fail to submit their, their spouses and their children's financial declarations with a 50% reduction in their salaries. The cases of parliamentarians who fail to comply even after suffering the salary reduction are to be sent to relevant agencies for investigation. Meanwhile, in the United States, President Donald Trump has failed to meet a congressional deadline for turning over his tax returns to politicians in the United States, setting the stage for a court battle between Congress and the administration. U.S. President Trump broke with a decades-old precedent by refusing to release his tax returns as a presidential candidate in 2016 or since being elected, saying he could not do so while his taxes were being audited. In news from the sporting arena, Sri Lanka will take on South Africa in the 35th match of the ICC Cricket World Cup tomorrow. Now, with Australia already qualifying for the semi-finals, a win for the Lions will increase their chances to be among the semi-finalists, with as many as six teams competing for the remaining three spots. News First, Martin Satyanesan filed this comprehensive report. Sri Lanka will take on Proteus in a must-win encounter tomorrow. And the question is, how can Sri Lanka qualify for the semi-finals? If Sri Lanka register two wins out of the three remaining matches, they will gain 10 points. And the most realistic scenario the Lankans would expect is England to lose both their matches against India and New Zealand, which will leave them at 8 points, while Pakistan to lose one of their games against Bangladesh or Afghanistan. And finally, Bangladesh to lose against India and win against Pakistan which will also leave them at 9 points. Eventually, New Zealand, Australia, India and Sri Lanka will qualify for the semi-finals, provided India and New Zealand does not cause a surprise. Now, if Sri Lanka register three wins out of the three matches remaining, their chances of qualifying for the semi-finals would almost be guaranteed. Riverside grounds in Chesterley Street will be the venue for your match tomorrow. In the last three years, Sri Lanka have registered only two wins against South Africa in nine matches and both the wins were achieved when they defended scores in excess of 290. When we look at the day matches at the venue, since the start of 2010, the highest successful score chased was 201 by England. During the same period, the lowest score defended was 256 by Sri Lanka against England. And the highest score defended was 274 by England against Pakistan. Weather should hold for a full contest tomorrow. And the Lions are full of confidence after beating the then number one ranked ODI side. An interesting statistic is that the team which had batted first after winning the toss have never won an ODI at Chesterley Street. Would the toss be a deciding factor tomorrow? Or will it be the skill? Let's find out tomorrow. And that's a wrap of primetime news on TV1 for today. Do follow these stories and details of more on our award-winning website, www.newsfirst.ok. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First team. Take care and God bless.